Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to episode 206 of Yes But Why podcast, featuring San Francisco-based performer, director, and educator, Radhika Rao. But first, a bit about our sponsor. This episode of Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. You can get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Guys, we're all at home. Audible has something to entertain you or enrich yourself with. Learn to garden, dig deeper into history, read Wuthering Heights and get it in a totally different way. No matter how you're spending your time in quarantine, Audible has something for you. Audible is available for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. This week's guest is Radhika Rao. Radhika is an actor, improviser, storyteller, director, writer, and arts educator out of San Francisco, California. Radhika was such a lovely person to talk to, and so well-adjusted. She tells stories about the ups and downs she's experienced, but she is so positive about it. She was really great, and honestly, revisiting this episode to edit it was another breath of fresh air. Things can be dicey these days, but guests like Radhika give me the strength to be excited again. I now present to you, Yes But Why, episode 206, Radhika Rao on trusting yourself and committing to your own path. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why Podcast. Yeah. I think I did one place in elementary school <laughs> and then I think I was part of one musical production in high school and just to give you some context I grew up in India and I grew up at a time when schools were very very um, academic and focused on academics I think it's gone now there's much more art I think back in uh, classrooms so um, but there was no focus on art, um, really. And so I, but those, just those two experiences and just watching movies, I think gave me the, gave me that, that feeling, that kind of confidence that I really like to perform. But I started performing in college. I joined the drama club. Oh. I went to a, a women's school and I joined a, the drama club there. And that's where I started performing. And then after I graduated, um, I decided to join a, a professional theater company. So I would say starting age 18 is when I started doing theater regularly. Did you want to do it before that and you just didn't have the opportunity? Yeah. Or... Yeah. 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 I, I'm sure I wanted, I, I knew I wanted to act. I didn't think I had a sense of what theater was so much yeah. um, because, you know, my parents didn't come from the arts world. So I wasn't really clued in, but I knew I wanted to act, but no opportunity, you know, nothing, you know? Yeah. So what was the drama club all about? Were they doing Shakespeare? <laughs> Were you guys doing? So, like, so you it's, know... it's India. So, you know, we, you know, so like a lot of traditional means. India. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, um, so to give you an example, yes, we did do Shakespeare's done all over the world. My first experience of Shakespeare was Julius Caesar uh, in Hindi, which is amazing. Wow. And I think I p played like Portia. So the first time I ever did Shakespeare was in Hindi. The first time I ever saw Shakespeare Shakespeare was in like a dialect of Hindi and it was a musical of Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, but beyond mm -hmm. that, like we did um, a lot of like popular, um, you know, Indian plays, contemporary plays, some classical plays. And then we also did like a lot of um, famous playwrights like um, you know, are um, are translated into Indian languages. So I did like Neil Simon and Eugene O'Neill and um, yeah, just like things like that that you, you know, did in like the local language. And there's there's English theater as well, but English theater in India is done by rich people and it's really like very privileged and weird kind of theater. Um, but, but the Hindi theater is really authentic. So yeah, that's it's how I started. It's pretty great that there's... Um... 
access to like current playwrights that are working though like even oh, yeah. at a collegiate level like mm-hmm. I don't think I read a play of an uh, of a person that wasn't hundreds of years dead until long <laughs> after I got out of college I mean that's that's yeah. funny yeah no we had living like there were living playwrights that we were studying and then also we had um India also has a very rich tradition of street theater Hmm. which is where you it's theater in the round but you basically take over occupy a space a public space and um and there's a few like maybe percussion or few instruments that people have but everybody gets into circle claps gets into circle and then in the round you perform a play that speaks to the current like political milieu and you make a statement so activism also happens in the form of theater and you get a permit from the police or whatever and then you just like occupy a space and talk about healthcare or occupy a space and talk about women's rights and it's through theater and and it can be improvisational in that the audience can talk back to you and you have to respond in the moment um and because it's like in the round and it's it's fluid like the audience can you know come in and out like it's very interesting and you can go into the audience and there's no stage so um i guess some of my theater there was improvisational even though I hadn't done improv you know I got into that later on in life yeah yeah was the political um you know occupying of a space something that happened like with your teachers like were they like this is a style that we're going to work on now and then you like go and do that or was that just something that happened and like something that you noticed since you were now in a more theatrical state of mind Oh, that's, um, I, I don't think that I actually saw a street theater show because they happen in certain parts of um, the city. Um, I, I come from New Delhi, so that's like, that's the capital. So I, but they, they happen closer to the political centers, you know, and um, where all the political activity happens. And I was more on the outskirts. I don't think I saw a play when I started doing theaters, when I really, you know, became part of this movement. Uh, but I didn't go to school for theater. I went to school for psychology. <laughs> I just joined the drama club. So I've never formally oh, studied sure. theater. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Was there even a theater major available? Um, there's one school that you go to, um, not a bachelor's theater major, but a master's that you can get after you do your bachelor's. Hmm. And um, and there, there was like, at that time, there was one school. Um, and it was like a state school. And there was yeah it was like and it was it was one school for the entire country really <laughs> and I didn't get in I tried I didn't get in oh. I wasn't good enough to be one of the billion Indians to get into a 30 C you know <laughs> to be one of the 30 few, lucky few you know but oh, it was well, it's I mean, crazy. one school is kind of <laughs> one intense I mean I know friends that are sad they didn't get into Yale grad school and it's like that's yeah. one of you know hundreds of theater yeah. grad schools they could have gone to so it's like one school like that's you're crazy. cool I feel like you don't have to don't feel bad <laughs> that sounds no, like crazy odds. it was fine <laughs> it was crazy odds plus there were quotas for different states you know oh. like for different states there's quotas and I was from Delhi which is like it's like saying you're from New York or LA like there's right. a dime a dozen actor yeah. like competitor so your chances so, were way worse than way you know. way way worse yeah. way worse and I don't think I was ready for it you know I don't even think I was yeah. that great like you know I wasn't that I wasn't that kid who was that theater kid like nah <laughs> yeah right on so when you got out of college were you like all into psychology did you like get a job in, in that and like no what no, happened like, after college I really wanted to do theater and there was no programs. I tried to get into the school and, you know, I didn't get in. I was heartbroken, but I didn't want to get into psychology. And I really like human behavior, but I didn't think that I could listen to somebody for that long. And I didn't. I didn't think psychology could make you happy. You know, I really felt like psychology couldn't make a difference. And that was my inexperience with psychology, you know. Um, and I, you know, if, if positive psychology had been around at that time, I would have probably been more amenable to being a psychologist. But I just didn't want to sit around and listen. And that 
And, um, but you know, 20 years later, it's so funny because I, I do a lot of improv where it's all about listening. I'm a teacher. It's all about listening. I'm practicing Buddhist where like, I, it's all about like taking in other people. <laughs> but at that time I didn't want to do it. Um, so I joined the theater group. Yeah. Um, I joined the theater group and I just said, I'm going to, and they didn't even pay, but I stayed to my, to my amazing Indian parents, uh, great dismay one of whom is a doctor the other one is an engineer I was like oh, I'm gonna join this you know group but they were amazing enough that they they were like okay um and but I just stayed at home and didn't make any money and was part of this theater group for a while and eventually I got a job um teaching in an educational company using some of these theater skills in a school um but I mooched off my parents for a bit (laughs) oh but right away you started teaching like that's that was part of your you know creative uh journey was to immediately start teaching huh that's that's great um, I didn't want to. My grandmother was a teacher and I didn't think it was a great profession. But I think when you're when you're an artist and you're broke, um, you get into teaching. And my how it happened was a friend of mine was um, supposed to teach a puppetry workshop for an outward bound program. And she had to drop out because she was getting really big and getting gigs. And she said, would I like to teach? And I said, yes, but I was so scared and anyway but that's how I got into it and I was like I don't know what I'm doing I I don't know if I know how to teach but I think I like this (laughs) so it scared me and excited me and gave me a sense of purpose so yeah pretty much like within the first year of me like really becoming a professional like theater person I started to teach and integrate theater and learning situations and you know that is kind of that's the path I've been on that's pretty great. So tell mm. me, tell me about your your experiences up top. You're in the troupe, you're performing, yeah. you're living with your parents still. Yeah. How did you move <laughs> forward from there? One assumes you're not still living with your parents. No, no. They decided to move my... to the Bay Area. You were like, <laughs> yeah. all right, I guess. No, it was uh, way more, you know, uh, crazy. Just to give you a cultural context, living with your parents isn't a big deal in India. So there was no shame to be true. That. Yeah. To be honest, I feel like everybody lives with their parents here too. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely the case in the Bay Area where real estate is so expensive. Yeah. yeah. But um, I was like 21, right? And I just, you know, new, new, fresh out of college. Um, but I, I think I, I definitely didn't want to make my own money. So, you know, as I started, you know, I started finding these jobs that I can't remember how they came my way, but, um the one big life event that happened was when I was 22 and I was actually really unhappy in this theater group because there was just a lot of toxic relationships and artists can be complicated. And I kind of reached an existential crisis where I wasn't enjoying myself. And, and I just said, wow, if I thought my life was about performing. And if this isn't, if I can't, if my life, if I'm not enjoying what I thought was my dream, then, you know, what's the purpose of life? And I think I fell into this like really deep existential crisis. And, um, and I think I was probably borderline depressed, like undiagnosed depressed. But at that time, um, one of my friends um, who was, she joined the same group that was causing me a lot of unhappiness. And she joined the same group, but somehow she was thriving and I was failing. And, um, and she had been trying to introduce me to Buddhism for many, many, you know, years. And, you know, sometimes to make a big shift in your life, you, you know, you know, shit has to hit the fan. But, you know, I saw that it was actually her attitude and, you know, her life condition, a life state that was so elevated that people didn't mess with her the way they did with me. So long story short, like I started practicing Buddhism, which essentially asks you a question. It says, who do you want to be in the world? And it's not about the environment. It's about you, you know, and when you change, everything changes. So when I asked myself that question, it became very clear that I loved teaching. I loved performing and and I I was really passionate about um creating a better world you know and 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 world peace if you will I wasn't sure what that meant but I just wanted people to get along and I come from a very diverse country with various religions castes all kinds of stuff and also a violent country because we you know you know we couldn't there's so much conflict I mean similar to America in so many ways and um so I kind of started 
like really chanting about that. And um, through many things that, you know, you could say coincidences, but I feel it was like the universe working. I got opportunities to teach, but also um, a friend of mine came back from um, Harvard, having done a program um, in theater and educa in, in education. And he said, you've got to go there. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I, um, you know, I, um, so I apply, I basically started looking into education programs because um, theater programs don't offer, um, don't offer scholarships and I didn't have any financial means. And not only did I start looking at theater pro uh, education programs, I looked at doctoral programs because there was no funding at that time in India to send anybody uh, to for a master's program. So I started looking at doctoral programs and I started writing applications on how to apply theater and education to create world peace. And I applied to a few schools, got rejected by all, but got accepted into Harvard. So that's Whoa. how I came to America. <laughs> Wait, that's and, how you got to America was Harvard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I did my, I have a, you know, doctor. Is, I'm a doctor of education. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> you know, you don't just have a doctorate in education. You have a doctorate in education from Harvard. Yep. That's, Remember that's earlier when you were talking about how there was this school you really wanted to go to and it didn't work out for you? Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> Radhika, I am from Boston and I applied oh. to Harvard and I did not get in. So that was my thing. That, that was the part of when I was 18 and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Harvard. And it was like, nope, thanks so much. Other person from our, from Boston <laughs> We don't care. <laughs> I was like, no. But I know, know. It, was, it was so crazy. I, What's I, you know, it like? It, what did you do? Like, what were you know? You don't have to tell well, me everything, but like adventures. Most, wow. It was amazing. I mean, I, I, it was, it was, it's very complicated. I don't know that. I don't know about undergrad because I went to grad school, and but I'll say that anybody who goes to Harvard has a very complicated relationship with Harvard. It's not like, oh my God, I loved Harvard. Like in the Bay Area, anybody who went to like, you know, Berkeley, who went to Cal State Berkeley, loves Berkeley. You know, UC Berkeley, excuse me, loves Berkeley. There's something about Berkeley like you just are loyal. Everybody who went to Harvard is a little bit like. You know, it's always complicated. You can never really say you're from Harvard because every time you tell somebody, it's like dropping a bomb. You know, one of the yeah. first dating advices I got in America was like, don't tell them you're from, don't drop the H bomb, you know, because <laughs> dudes get intimidated by by oh, that. God. And I know. But it was, I mean, it was, I, I went to the poorest school, you know, education, divinity, and the school of public health are the poorest schools. <laughs> so we're like literally even on like, we're the smallest schools, we, we don't get, that we don't get a lot of scholarships we don't have fun that much funding but we're really happy people the teacher it's a school full of like people interested in teaching so they're committing to a poor life but it was really really you know the school was was probably one of the happiest places the rest of harvard can be full of like super intelligent but really emotionally dysfunctional people <laughs> but i think the school of education is probably one of the happiest schools but it was kind of crazy like to be at this place where you know, there are these dudes like rowing and all of this like Widener Library, the biggest library, you know, in America. And and you just continually you you just ask yourself what you're doing there. But to be very honest, um, it wasn't the most humanistic education. And um when I was there, which is between two thousand three and nine, uh, my program became less and less humanistic. So they shut down the Native American program, they shut down the gender studies program because I guess, you know, we're equal now and we don't really need to fight, you know, women don't really have anything to fight for. Um and sure. they <laughs> systematically got rid of faculty that were working in race, class, and gender. So I came at a really interesting time, but I believe the purpose for me going there was to kind of know that, you know, Harvard or power or privilege or people who go to these elite institutions don't necessarily change the world. They might become president, but they may not change the world. You know, the, the country is full of like ex-Yale, Princeton, Harvard people, but they aren't you know, they think with their heads, but not with their hearts enough, you know. So it was interesting. It was complicated. I got out in time and I wrote a good dissertation on how to use theater in building, um, you know, youth citizenship, which is like basically talking about high school theater programs and how it makes young people uh, belong. And I studied um, particularly program at Cambridge Rint and Latin, which everybody knows is where Matt Damon and Ben Affleck went to school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it was it was really amazing because it was a very very diverse school 
with a rich history and uh, there were many new immigrants there many like kids of color and who didn't feel like society just gave them the message that they didn't belong that they you know you have you might have a passport but you didn't belong and um so they did this program this theater program which is based off of like theater of the oppressed um and um Anna Devier Smith's ethno drama which is basically where you go into your community and do interviews and you record those interviews and then you perform those interviews and so they went in as youth citizens and um the mayor of cambridge um their program paid for these young people to be part of this program so instead of working at like your local sears or coles or macy's in the summer they were part of this program and they put this play together based on experiences of uh, real people in cambridge and talking about gentrification social justice violence in the community you know and um, they put the show up in front of the community in front of cambridge people and then as youth leaders they basically you know had dialogues with the community so it was an incredible that my dissertation was based off of that and what happens when young people engage in in a theatrical process that is geared towards like social justice and empowerment how they start to feel like um they belong in a community and so i mean yeah what is what is citizenship look like beyond voting because they were all under 18 these kids but um you know what does it look like if you can't vote you know which is you know a a a a question that i continue to ask myself because i have a green card and i'm not a citizen yet i filed for citizen but i'm not i technically can't vote you know um mm. and so but what does it mean does that not mean i've lived in this country for 16 and a half years and what ways do i participate in uh, american democracy so yeah that's what i ended up studying there that's really great i really love <laughs> this idea of like giving the voice to the youth because you know they're at that point in their lives where it's really important for them to say what they are thinking and what yeah. matters to them yeah. like it's not always uh you know we don't always feel strong enough or fearless enough as we do when we're you know in high school um yeah. so it's it's important to empower them early i yeah. um I think that that is really, really amazing. And what a cool thing to do a dissertation on. Um, no, it was really, really great. That. It was really great. Yeah. Uh, that that was the, the last year of my program over there was really happy because I ended up, you can teach a class also as an, um, you know, as an, um, later stage you know doctoral student so i ended up teaching a class about um you know this topic and i also ended up like doing a great dissertation and i played a leading uh, i find i was so tired because i for five years i hadn't done theater but i was studying theater but i hadn't been in a play so i think out of my frustration i auditioned and was cast as the lead in a show just a small like company in in boston but i ended up like doing that too and so i felt very victorious by the end of it yeah you did it all <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's great. I did it all. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice. And then I got out of there and I'm like, I'm not going into academia. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. Like, I need yeah. to go back into the classrooms. I need to teach. I need to act. I need to go back to my roots, you know. And, um, you know, and I had um, in my second semester fallen in love with, um, you know, a person who was also at Harvard. And he, by that time, had moved to San Diego to become a professor of literature. And so I Ooh. kind of followed him to San Diego and then he got a job. Job, uh, you know, in San Francisco, and that's how we moved. You know, that's how we moved out here. So I got, I got, I, I let patriarchy move me, to California, <laughs> but, I, but, but I'm not complaining. And then our marriage fell apart, which was really fun too. <laughs> oh, fun! Okay, but great. I, at Glad least, you have a at good least point I, of view. Yeah, but at least I, uh, I ended up in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, well, you know, I like that you say the uh, patriarchy moved you out. You know, just because you just because you moved to be in a relationship doesn't necessarily mean it was patriarchy. I mean, it sounds to That's me like true. you needed to change it up. And uh, as a person who is originally from Boston, I know that the uh, tone of that city can be a little intense. And yes. you probably needed to move anywhere. So. Uh, uh, when he was like, hey, do you want to be in gorgeous San Diego? You were like, "Ah, uh, yeah, I'm going. And if I don't have to hear another guy yell in an accent that's deeply disturbing, I got to get out of here. 
yeah. you know what the fu- the funny thing was i really love boston cuz i <laughs> come from a city that's like 10 times less friendly than boston so when i came whoa. to boston i was like whoa this is great and it was <laughs> i actually didn't want to move you know and i say patriarchy because so often women move because men are paid more money and men have the more lucrative jobs and so oh, we give up yeah. our lives but i really didn't want to move but at the same time you're right i needed I needed the sunshine but I hated San Diego for the first 6 months because I was like wow I'm going from a liberal to kind of this conservative place I was like why is it sunny all the time why are people <laughs> smiling all the time this Maybe sucks. Boston is right for you I don't know <laughs> it's, it's, No not anymore not not anymore I am so a Californian but the funniest thing was you know I had an Indian I mean I have an Indian accent but when I came to California people were like wow you sound like you're from Boston <laughs> <laughs> so I had a Boston you I think I had a Boston Indian accent. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "Oh, where in Boston smacked. are you She's from?" Smacked. And you're like, "Oh god. Get me out of here." <laughs> I've never heard you're so funny. I've never heard anybody in the world say that Boston seemed friendly. My yes. what's funny is my token story is right after college I moved to New York City. So when I moved to New York City I was like, "Wow, everyone here is so nice and friendly." And people were like, "What are you talking about?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention I'm from Boston." So <laughs> New York is like, oh, look at how gentle and sweet they are to each other. Like <laughs> Now I live in Austin, which let's be clear is a magical wonderland. I But, it is, um, I've heard. It is. Yeah. I mean, certainly compared to Boston and New York. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm yeah. sure San Francisco is compared to, you know, yeah. New Delhi and then Boston. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. So when you finally got to the Bay Area, did yeah. you really were you able to now this whole time that you've been going to Harvard, you yeah. have you been um still practicing and getting inspiration and strength from your Buddhism? And, yeah, yeah. 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 Because it was like so that was such a big deal that like sort of got you on the path. Um right. I wonder, you know, did it maintain yeah. for you while you were there? Absolutely it was a source of great support and you know I was I was quite unhappy through much of my time at Harvard because I you know there were a lot of things that happened over there that just weren't amenable like I what I wanted to study like you know all the professors were leaving in that field so didn't know if I belonged I felt very very sick we sometimes call it a harvard sickness you know that people are just so there's just that kind of like drive and unbalanced lifestyle that makes people sick so you know I felt sick for about 6 months and I had to take a break from my program but um through that through all of that buddhism gave me so much strength and just you know um you know just like gave me that kind of confidence that i just needed to finish the program and make the best of it and in even in moments of strife like so much value can be created it's never you know actually when you face adversity that's when you create that's when you grow the most in your life so yeah. um yeah so that absolutely there's there was a community there and um the buddhist organization that i belong to called the soka gakkai international they exist everywhere even in austin and so you know i was just able to just like join there and um but yeah yeah it was um you know it was, it was there and it still is a big part of my life and how i you know approach the world and how i deal with uh, any difficult moments or how i appreciate the good moments yeah yeah but yeah. Uh, since you've gotten to the bay area um have have things gotten i mean i guess after the tumultuous end of the relationship um <laughs> yes. was uh were you able to find um like a new community you know or you know like how yeah. did it go for you you moved to san yeah. fran relationship yeah. not awesome and yeah. then you got to figure it out what happened then yeah yeah that was um you know um it's so interesting what i my i think my uh, marriage ended 2015 so it's been um 5 years now it's incredible and um that was also like a really crazy time in america that was like uh well you know we still had a clinically sane president you know in the white house but like now it's like sorry i don't know what your politics are but right. so i'm just talking from yeah <laughs> yeah but um you know and so but it was also like 
you know, I think it was a crazy time in America, but um, I think when that fell apart, I was actually really thriving in my um, professional career. And I, I almost feel it was because I was really booming and I was starting to grow and I, my work was getting a lot of attention um, in a way that it hadn't gotten before in San Diego and Boston um, that I think something sometimes relationships fall apart, you know, because of that. Or my ex might have thought like, you know, she, she, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe this is not the life I want with a performing artist. I don't know what his thinking was. And, you know, but sure. um, I basically got dumped and, <laughs> um, and it was really, it was really interesting that I said yes to that. Like talk about like, you know, just saying yes. <laughs> to yes. And, and, um, and, and I think that yes was coming from a really deep conviction. There's something when sometimes your life just gives you these messages and you, you know, if you tune in and follow them, it's really great. So um, I think when, um, when a relationship falls apart, sometimes like the just two people are just with each other. But there were these people in my periphery. I've always valued friends. I've always valued friends and I've always prided myself on being a good friend. But I think when that marriage fell apart, I almost those people that when the periphery came into the focus and it's almost like my family grew from a family of two to like a family of like a hundred, you know? And um, so I was actually, um, because I was a performing artist and this is 2015. So the economy is shit. Like the real estate is, is up like real estate is like bad in san francisco uh rent is crazy there's um not that many great paying jobs for artists or teachers um jobs are being cut like it was so bad but i ended up uh, what ended up happening is i did move out but shortly after i couldn't pay rent anymore and i ended up living with friends for a year and a half i lived in i moved nine times in a year and a half mm -hmm. and um i had you know that's when i discovered how many great friends i have you know because i actually lived very comfortably and always had a room of my own you know and crashed with friends you know so it pays to be indian because there's a lot of software engineer friends i had you know <laughs> who were in the bay area and that's why i'm like kids don't do a bfa program then you'll only know poor people so <laughs> yeah. it's okay i mean we're all gonna pay student loans just get a business yeah. degree it'll be better just just better it'll help you, know, you run your theater yeah. yeah. So I, you know, that was a great experience where like community really grew for me. Yeah. And, um, and a big part of my community, there was a Buddhist community, and then there was a theater performing community, and the improv community, and the teaching community. And, uh, you know, and then friends who I'd known from school that happened to be in the area or from college. And, you know, they just came suddenly and to sharp relief, you know, they were just there, you know. So it was really amazing. And so for a year and a half, I did pay rent in the Bay Area. And so I was able to take these artistic risks with my life and really grow my artistic and professional like resume and career without like worrying too much about rent, which is um, sometimes half of our income in the Bay Area. Um, yeah. But if not half, like 30 to 40 percent. And because of that, like I think I really solidified. I, you know, I think, yeah, I just I really because when, when my marriage fell apart, my I wasn't making that much money. My ex was. So I, I wondered if I needed to take on a regular job. But I, I just never did. I just kept continuing with my passion and doing this, you know, this kind of like, I don't even know what to call it, like potpourri of stuff that I do. Um, you know, and I just, I just like, gained great conviction. And now I'm like, dang, if I can be single and live in San Francisco and, you know, and survive, I live in a rent controlled apartment. I'm able to manifest that. Then you know what? I just need to keep following my dreams and keep going on my path. Like I don't need to backtrack. <laughs> you have a great perspective on what's happened yeah. through the journey. Yeah. That's really yeah. great. I do thank my ex every day because it was it was painful. But, you know, like these are Buddhism. This is a Buddhist perspective that even people who cause you pain, if you really, you know, dip, you know, can be your good friends because he really wasn't the partner who was going to support the life that I wanted, you know, and I would have. Um, yeah, there's a part of you that you kind of that I was hiding being with him that I didn't realize. And so it just let me just blossom. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I do. I do thank him. I really I do thank him Man. for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so much happier that I have no like uh, I don't have any pain or any regrets from that. You know, I get dumped a lot because oh. I think sometimes I don't know my own worth. So I get dumped a lot. So now I have like a lot of confidence in the universe. I'm like, oh, OK. 
<laughs> I didn't think it was good enough. <laughs> You're like, it's fine. Turns out that guy wasn't it. See ya. It wasn't it. It wasn't it. And, yeah. it, and it always happens that it's right. You know, and obviously I'm constantly working on myself, but I, I think that I, you know, it's also not about working on yourself. It's about just being who you are and, you know, finding that person who's able to, you know, be with you the way you are. I think I'm pretty awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, totally. that was, that's, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. I also like to think about how, like, you mentioned it earlier, the idea that, like, you know, you have to want to have a certain kind of lifestyle with a person. You mm. have to be cool with them yeah. having the kind of job yeah. that they do. You right. know, it's like, right. I'm sorry right. that I don't have the kind of security that brings in money every week right. or every other week. Like, right. it's a smattering here and there, yeah. but I'm doing what I want to do. Can you handle being part of that? Like, and some people can't, yes. like... That's a really interesting part that I've noticed as, you know, friends yeah. of mine have coupled or, or right. not, you know, and it's like, well, you know, that one, that person's an artist through and through. They're like never going to stop yeah. doing that. So you can't right. just expect them to, I don't know, get a nine to five. That's just not the world that they could do. No. And it's, um, yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it's, part of this is growing up right like I met my you know then partner when I was you know I just turned 27 and our relationship fell apart when I was 38 you know mm -hmm. and um, so you're a different person then and you don't even have the I don't even have the language I think when you're in your mid 20s sometimes you're just looking for the one and you know it, it's just a very different dynamic and but it's interesting being in this second phase of my life where I, you know, I have language and I know what I want. And I know what I deserve. And it's like, you're just there with eyes that are way more open than when I was younger. Like I just didn't have that kind of perspective. Um, so it's yeah, a lot like of growing, growing too. up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot better it, having the perspective to look back at various adventures that I've had and, yeah. and, you know, know how I felt about them at the time and then see right. like, Recently, I've had a few moments where, like, I'll think about something that I did in my past, and yeah. old lady Amy has is like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I did such a thing. But at the time, right. I remember, you know, being like, this is crazy, but you're going to do this, and it's going to be okay. And then right. I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my stars, <laughs> older me says, right? But that's why younger people do wilder things. It's amazing the distance we can have from the mistakes that we made such that we can learn from them and actually become really, truly better people yeah. in, that, in that scenario, you know? Yeah. So right now in your life, and yeah. I know that this won't be released like tomorrow or whatever, but like, right, right. what's the exciting thing that you're working on right now? Like, what's the project yeah. that you're most excited about at this very yeah. moment? Yeah. So many, and that's just generally like, um, you know, that's just generally the pattern of my life that um, that I'm excited. Like last year, I wasn't, but I'm so happy to say I, I'm excited. I'm inspired. So I've been acting for what twenty years of my life now, but this year I'm starting. To, I'm directing two really wonderful pieces, and um, you know, one of them is for a festival that's called Les Rights you know, as a lesbian rights and it's at the, at the theater called three girls theater, but I'm, and I'm directing a, um, a women's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, a two, two person show, uh, between, which is, um, you know, a play about, a a, a non-binary Jen Zier, you know, college student. Um, and the other is about, and the other a person in the play is her grandma, who's a lesbian grandma. And it's all about like language changing and gender binaries and who fought for what. And, you know, uh, and so it's it's really cool. I'm working on directing that. I'm directing a one woman show um, with a friend of mine in it. I am um, a play of mine that has traveled um, to many cities, including Houston, um, is going to um, is is being um, revived and it's showing at the um, uh, at this theater called called Z Space, which is a dance drama about a uh, an empress, a South Asian uh, empress, a Persian empress who migrates to um, you know to India and becomes the most you know, famous first lady ever. Um, and so it's a big feminist piece from a South Asian perspective. It's a dance drama. And I do like 15 voices for the dancer who's the front of the stage. Super excited about that. I just, um, 
finished shooting an episode for a um a series called Hirayat which is about immigrants in America and uh the first episode is on on Amazon Prime it's spelled H I R A E T H and I think I'm in the second episode if I'm not mistaken I'm not sure <laughs> but I just finished shooting that huh. um yeah and then um How yeah there's a lot of that yeah I'm busy and yeah. I'm um I'm teaching a lot. I'm teaching improv a lot. Um I'm teaching seniors for the first time like senior citizens. I'm going to be teaching them long form oh. improv which I'm really excited about. Um and um and they apparently make amazing improvisers of course because they have all this life experience and they don't give a damn. <laughs> and yeah, I've had uh, a so, couple of students yeah. in their 80s and they were real fun. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I'm very, very excited about that. And um, I'm teaching, I teach a course um, at the University of San Francisco that I'm very excited about that uh, teaches teachers how to use arts in the classroom. And so, and then I'm hoping to, I'm doing a few corporate gigs, you know, like in in uh, in San Francisco, um, you know, we have a lot of techies who want to know how to communicate, yeah, use yeah. eye contact. Nice. <laughs> so we play games with them, learn, you know, t- speak to them about their voice and improv really improv and improvisational activities really helps them open up so that kind of work yeah. i also work in like medical schools um you know with do you know what a standardized patient program is no tell me about it um so it's um it's a now pretty widely used but it is a um it's a training um and every in every like well funded medical school uh, medical students will see a standardized patient which is a fake patient so that oh. they see and um and so that they get the experience of meeting a real person you know in a simulated situation oh and so you um act and as the patient so we act as the patient then we play oh. out the scenario and then we partner with the medical faculty to to talk to them about their social skills you know and their whether they were empathic mm. enough whether they were um was there anything in their voice that was judgy did they use your name during the encounter did they smile did they you know what were their bedside manner like so it's really cool yeah. it's kind of an acting and an educational position and i do a lot of that um so i'm always very excited to do uh, that kind of medical acting so to speak you know we're currently uh, piloting remote uh, remote cases of you know a lot of doctors now in um healthcare systems uh, allow patients to Skype their doctors but that's a totally uh, different you know can of worms so we're teaching doctors how to socially relate <laughs> you know to their patients over Skype or over like you know Zoom or something like that and the barriers that need to be crossed for that so it's really wow. fun <laughs> yeah that's great i mean that's yeah. that's some really important stuff that doctors need to have as skills you know yeah. they've yeah. got some delicate information to be uh parsing out. very delicate to be uh you gotta yeah. be careful with that kind of thing yeah the you know oh the last case i did was about they basically have to tell me that the baby in my womb you have these fake wombs it's very high tech but they have to tell me that i have a stillborn child in my like base because oh. i think my my water is broke my water broke and they and i think i'm going to have a baby but they have to tell me that it's not a viable pregnancy and that my baby has, is dead and it, i have to break down and cry and it's crazy and so they're learning those kind of like how do you even those kind of situations like how do you deliver like that kind of news so it's very draining <laughs> and very exciting and because wow. we have actor skills you know we can break out of it but those poor nurses and doctors are often like totally shook by the situation <laughs> oh yeah Yeah, that's true. I forget that. You know, I was recently talking to like an actor friend about like sort of the breadth of emotion that I like feel in a day. And we were discussing yeah. like, you know, that not everybody feels that way. Right. And I'm like, no. I think that's crazy. Like I'm like breaking down in, in like crying, like hard tears at a like radio commercial. And like, right. you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, he just got the mortgage, <laughs> you know, like I, I, you know, I can't get around it. It's just like, yeah. and you know, when I teach my acting classes, I'll say things to them like, y- your, y- 
you know, your creative ability allows you to access a part of the world that other people can't access. So that's where you get it, that you're able to act uh, like other people and understand them and have a deeper empathy is because you just have a natural ability to access that emotion. Some people are like, yeah, I'm happy. What? But I'm like, yeah. no, I've got like gradients of happy where I'm like, you know, I don't know. I'm a little, but not a lot. It was like 20%, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. No, we're like emotional bungee jumpers. Like we just jump <laughs> off, you know, and, and it's like, and it's, it, there's a lot of courage required, but it's like, you know, we're not putting out fires or we're not like going to war, but emotionally we have a lot of courage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you've spoken a lot about, you know, a lot of courage, actually, a lot of different wild things have happened in your life and you've like made it through and maintained your sort of creative path throughout, even though, you know, I appreciate that your point of view is positive. So like you, everything that happened that was hard, you're like, but it sprung me towards the next great thing, but not everybody looks at it that way. No. What advice do you have for people? to like keep it going you know like when times are tough you've clearly kept it going like you could have quit you could have been like okay I'll work you know in a travel agency or whatever but you did it you were like I'm gonna do this how did you keep it going what kept your strength up yeah I mean I think I think what kept my strength up, um, you know, really was, you know, my, my faith, you know, in, in myself. But when I say faith in myself, it really came from my, you know, Buddhist practice, which enabled me to trust myself and also the community that I was, you know, surrounded by. And, um, you know, I sometimes even when I feel alone, I think I'd realize there's always people around you, you know, uh, there's always people who want to help and are there. So I it wouldn't have been able to do it without like my friends and my family and, you know, how, you know, incredible they are. Um, and I realized how much, you know, privilege I had in that situation. Um, but advice that I would would give, especially to people who are in the arts or in difficult professions, like maybe nursing or teaching or, you know, uh, is to really commit to your um, mental, emotional and spiritual health. I think we don't prioritize that enough. And, you know, we're at a very crucial time in America's like history. We have like a suicide epidemic in this country, you know, especially with young people. You know, we have a loneliness epidemic. We haven't prioritized relationships and we haven't prioritized emotional health. And I believe we're collectively sick as a society. It's not just, you know, it's not healthy for there to be shootings every day someplace in America it's not healthy for us for you know young people or people to take their lives it's but it's collectively there's something off and so we really need to commit to our our mental emotional and psychological health and I feel like because I did that you know I I did that when I was young by the time like life got tougher you know in my late 30s like I had tools so you we need tools because especially as an artist or whatever your path is if you want to be successful like you said it's it's not going to be you know very few people make it big or are discovered in a moment most of the times it's a journey and even sometimes when you hit the big time that doesn't guarantee happiness at all you know we're truly happy when we when we do what we're meant to do on this planet and only we can do what we can do and that's a really important lesson and and whatever you do that brings other people happiness and creates value will ultimately come back to you so you know that kind of messaging is very hard to give to yourself if you don't have a community or kind of a value system so whatever it is like commit to your emotional and spiritual health you know it doesn't need to be religion but (laughs) there is something called the spirit (laughs) you know um so yeah that's what i would say is uh would be my advice um and find people who believe in you improv you know like i found the the tools that i needed to get through some of the harder times you know yes Um, you know sometimes the like just you know how like the beauty of letting it go like at the end of a scene when it's over and like you never go back to it again, like yes. that embracing that like in real life every yeah. moment, you know what I mean? 
Like, I try to have, especially, okay, also, once you have a baby and you're, like, on your own walking around with the baby, you are just, like, a lonely island trying to find other people to talk to. Like, oh, hey. So I go to the grocery store and have random conversations with strangers because I hadn't talked to an adult in multiple days. Like, and the improv helped me through it. So I was like, I can do this. Just talk about anything. And I'm like, apples, am I right? right? Like, uh, yeah. It's like so it's a great way to help you open up and connect and, you know, to give you the tools to um, be with other people and it be it feel less scary than it could. I 100 percent agree. Improv has given me that, you know, being there with the other person, listening, making your partner look good, you know, all of those tools. I really learned to just to say yes to that moment. And I love what you just said about like, um, you know, it's never going to come back again. So just let it go, you know. And um, yeah, it's also taught me about breathing a lot, you know, just breathing and mindfulness, Mm -hmm. you know, and just breathe. You don't have to you know, just take a moment. You don't have to immediately respond or react or, um, you know, try to be funny. The funny is always in the unexpected, you know, and, and, and life is funny because whenever you tell your story, when the trauma is passed, everything that happens to you is kind of funny. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's my favorite. When something terrible happens, there is a voice in the back of my head that just goes and enough time. This will be a great story. This will be a great story someday. Not right now, but someday Not right now. you're going to be like, well, let me tell you about that time this thing happened. Yep. I have a bunch of those, too, where I'm like, you think a terrible thing is going to change your whole life? Let me tell you yeah. how this terrible thing happened to me. And look, I'm not gone. <laughs> yeah. I oh, mean. man. <laughs> Well, Radhika, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me, to share your stories with me. Um, I really appreciate you um, telling me about your journey. And, you know, you just have a great attitude and a good energy that, you know, hopefully will inspire some people in my audience to get out there and be an actor or just commit to their creative path uh, the way that you have. Yes, thank you. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.